So thank you everyone for making the effort to be here. <clears throat> it's really, really something I'm so excited about to have this opportunity. Thank you, David. Thank you to all colleagues at Boston College uh, and the Lynch School of Education and Development. Thanks to Sheldon as well. So let's begin. Why this slightly counterintuitive title, The Pleasure of Hating? doesn't seem to make an awful lot of sense, and indeed it does sound very counterintuitive. Hopefully, within the next hour or so, we'll be able to make some inroads. We'll be able to see why that title might have something useful to say about racism more generally. We could say that in the history of much psychological theory and continental philosophy, or much of psychology and continental psychoanalysis, we have a proverbial instance of two ships passing in the night. Awful lot of work's done on each side, but hardly ever is there an exchange of ideas. And I think that's what we're going to aim at today. My basic assumption, my basic starting point is to say that those of us who are interested in psychology, who work in psychology, or those of us who are interested in racism and trying to further an interrogation of racism can learn something from Lacanian psychoanalysis and the rather odd notion that Lacanian psychoanalysis asserts, namely that racism can be understood as a kind of theft of enjoyment. So that's what we want to do tonight. We're going to do a little bit of critical work. We're going to explore that idea. We're going to open up various facets of that idea. Hopefully, we'll also have some opportunity to ask some critical questions about this thesis. Let me say right from the outset that it's True, Lacanian psychoanalysis has its limitations, and indeed, hopefully, we'll have an opportunity to ask some questions about that. But what our real priority is, is trying to open up some of these ideas that may help us to rethink various facets of racism, and that may, in many ways, also offer a series of critical uh, thinking points, a critical reformulation. Hopefully, it'll help us interrogate some of the basic assumptions we often have when we start thinking about what racism is, how it works, and what underlies that. And that, I think, would be valuable critical work. Let me also say that rather than be very theory heavy, I'm going to try and lead with examples. And to do that, I brought my own little private library along. So uh, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, introduce you to some of it's like a DJ, except that I've read, read from books rather than play tunes. OK, so we're doing a little bit of Derek's library thing. And last introductory comment is to say that this is very much, I think, absolutely in tune with the project for what the psychological humanities might be. In other words, we're going to look to a discipline outside of psychology that says different things. We're going to use lots of examples. We're going to look at literature and we're going to try and explore this thesis. So without further ado, we can ask the first question. What is racist enjoyment? We see this term in Lacanian theory time and time again, the notion of enjoyment or, as in French, jouissance. What is jouissance? And what indeed is racist jouissance, racist enjoyment? Again, sounds like a contradiction in terms. But I think maybe the best way to try and introduce this, here's the first of my examples, is to make reference to a film called This Is England. It's a, I think it's a 2008 film. Uh, the director is Shane Meadows. And in This Is England, which is the story of a young boy who loses his father and is totally rudderless. His father dies in the Falklands War. The kid must be like 10 or 11. He's rudderless. He doesn't know which way to go with his life. And he gets taken under the wing by some skinhead guys. And in halfway through the film, they take him off to a British National Party rally. So the BNP, British National Party, is a neo-fascist far-right party. And what we see in this scene is the little kid and his new friends, they go off to this rally. And there's a speaker. The speaker's giving a speech and he's extolling all the virtues and values of what England has been and what a white England can continue to be. But he's also getting into this kind of furious, inflamed state where he's explaining all the ills, all the problems, all the threats. And of course, why this scene is so important is that in this moment, you start to see the audience being aroused, being inflamed, being uh, agitated, 
almost in this, you could call it a kind of pseudo orgasmic quality where they're clearly uh, stimulated, agitated. And basically they seem to be getting off on their hate, getting off on their racism. That's a perfect choice of words here because that getting off, that inflamed, aroused, transgressive, disturbed bodily state is precisely what we have in mind when we talk about enjoyment in Lacanian theory or jouissance. That state of a kind of morbid excitation of the body is our first crucial point. That's what we mean when we say the enjoyment of racism. So we could kind of retrospectively go back to our title. Yes, I've called it the pleasures of hate. And um, in so doing, I have borrowed from William Hazlitt, who wrote an essay more than 200 years ago on the same topic. First book, B.J. Derrick from my library. And we could just nuance that a little bit. We're talking more about the enjoyment of hate or what you could call the negative pleasure of hate. The agitation, the morbid excitation, this inflamed, impassioned, aroused state, which comes with a mode of uh, inflamed hatred. Now that's not all we're going to say. There are other ways of thinking about what jouissance is. And part of my agenda here will be to try to demarcate and illustrate those. That's our first example. Immediately you may be thinking, I don't know, I'm thinking, maybe it's a problematic example. Why so? Well, it seems a slightly problematic example in as much as we've been able to delegate the racism of others. It's skinheads who are racist, not us. Okay, so we could say maybe we need to think of a different example. Let's try again. Second book in Derek's library, except it says my public library, sorry about that, but it's called The Slap. It's by uh, Christos Tsiolkas. And I'm going to give you this, uh, this quote. This is a great example, I think, because the novel is all about um, a kind of suburban middle class set of friends who are, uh, you know, having various dilemmas. And we've got um, a character who's a good, progressive, liberal minded character. She's about to get out of a taxi cab. It's in Sydney, I believe, and she's in a bad mood. Here we go. She was usually courteous to taxi drivers. They were invariably immigrant men. And she told herself that in treating them with respect and dignity, she was separating herself from the immense sea of indifferent racists out there. But in this moment, she felt neither courtesy nor respect. To hell with him, she thought sourly. Ignorant pig, she received an illicit thrill from the jolt of hatred. That's it right there. That phrase, an illicit thrill from the jolt of hatred. That's what I want us to think about. Why illicit, we might ask. And that's helpful to ask that question in as much as in that moment, the illicit thrill is there precisely because the thought, the impulse that she's had stands in such stark contrast to her professed beliefs. And to be clear, I'm not suggesting that somehow uh, the fact that she has this thought means that she's fundamentally racist all along. No, the point here is that she is liberal, she is progressive. Those are the values that she aspires to. Those are the values that characterize much of her life. But the notion of jouissance is now starting to get a little bit more complex for us because what starts to become apparent then is that even though I can be the progressive, good, self-critical scholar, all of those factors, you could say, as it were, make the thrill, the illicit thrill of saying something, thinking something that I shouldn't, all the more voluptuous. So here we get a sense then that enjoyment is typically transgressive. It is engendered precisely by doing what one shouldn't, by contravening what is a kind of moral uh, standard. And there's also, oddly enough, this kind of relish in the moment of the transgression. And for me, I suppose, when I was looking at the literature and trying to get a good sense of how this might be easily understood, I was thinking about hate speech and the relish and the, the, the again, I used that word before, but the voluptuous quality of the hatefulness of hate speech 
In other words, to go back to the point we've been trying to say, in those moments, the very aggressiveness of the, that language contains a certain kind of illicit thrill, uh, a relish, a type of enjoyment, an obscenity, a self-reflexive enjoyment at what one has said. What is our point? And we build into the end of our first section of our talk. Our point is that you can have liberal progressive uh, identities and sentiments and understandings and values, and they can exist quite comfortably alongside exactly the transgressive thrills that one gets from being racist. I'm trying to emphasize this point because I'm in much of the psychological literature, this is not something that's easily appreciated because I think much common sense thinking, both about racism and much common sense psychological theorizing, has a difficulty in, in keeping these two very contradictory states together. One of the benefits, I'm hoping, from thinking psychoanalytically is we can appreciate the dynamism whereby those two things can exist. And indeed, you could almost say that the more I attempt to be the good, liberal, non-racist subject, I also somehow surreptitiously make possible the libidinal gains of the enjoyment for being racist. Let me just add one more point before we move on to our second section. Um, and here I'm much indebted to Todd McGowan, who's made this point um, perhaps better than me. He's got a lovely critique of notions of implicit racism or implicit bias or unconscious bias. And he says, the problem with those theories, which may seem to be much inspired by psychoanalysis, is that they fundamentally misunderstand something. Racism, he argues, is not fundamentally a problem of knowledge or cognition. Racism, it may be that too, but racism is much more fundamentally a problem of enjoyment. Hence our topic tonight. So let's move on. We're building some complexity here. Let's make two crucial qualifications. Number one, often when people hear, oh, you're talking about psychoanalysis, you're talking about unconscious. Well, some of the fantasies and ideas and values that come along with racism presumably are less than fully conscious, but jouissance, enjoyment, is primarily a body state, okay? It's a bodily state of arousal, of agitation, as I've been saying. So we shouldn't think about enjoyment as itself unconscious. The second crucial qualification that we should make here is that when we're talking about jouissance and we're talking about social modes of jouissance, we are also saying that social modes of jouissance are powerfully bonding. They are, if we enjoy together, even if it remains largely unspoken, how we enjoy together is also a very powerful means, it's kind of social glue of holding a community together. And I'm always reminded here of a wonderful quote, a kind of sobering quote by Jacqueline Rose. Uh, she makes this point. She says, hate is one of our most satisfying passions. And unfortunately, not only is it one of our most satisfying passions, but it far outweighs the libidinal rewards of making way for others or of love. This kind of passion of hate is a kind of bonding factor. Little small anecdotal um, detail here. I've got a neighbor, a couple of, uh, well, he's not quite a neighbor, a few streets away from me. His bumper sticker simply says, I hate Penn State. And I, I like, I, you know, I always, I got to love him for that. It's like, dude, you, of all the words in the English language you could have picked to put on your bumper sticker, the identity you want to affirm is that you hate Penn State. Anyways, I don't think we need to explore that further. I think that kind of makes the, the point about how jouissance can be a mode of bonding. Let's now move to think about our second major subtopic, and that is how might we understand something about the intersubjectivity of jouissance, the intersubjectivity of enjoyment. And here I take a nice quote from uh, a guy called David Macy, and he offers this. He says, jouissance is not a category of pure subjectivity. It implies a dialectic of possession and enjoyment of and by the other. And I want us to focus a little bit on this dialectic of possession. Or, let's put it slightly differently, we're shifting gears a little bit. We focused on jouissance as an impassioned state, a bodily agitation. Now we want to think about what happens when we make attributions of other people's jouissance and when, <clears throat> how we manage our enjoyment and what we think about other people's. So we can say that one way of understanding and approaching this Lacanian idea of racism as the theft of enjoyment is precisely by thinking how enjoyment works as a type of possession. 
Well, two things we can say right off the bat. Number one, our own enjoyment is not something that we often are hugely comfortable with. It's not something we broadcast. It's not something that we typically own up to. We tend to disavow it. If you see me in an impassioned state of anger um, and someone said you're enjoying this moment, I would tend to say probably not. So we have a tendency to disavow our jouissance and we also have a tendency to think other people are enjoying. And more than just that, we tend to have, a, the assumption is that other people enjoy more than me and in undeserved ways. Now we can draw a couple of conclusions from this. Let's just, before we do that, let's make one further speculative comment, which draws on, on psychoanalytic theory. And in this moment, I'm going to quote, sorry, narcissistic moment from myself. <clears throat> Here we go. Most of us feel, if we're kind of neurotic, if we're kind of whatever, normal, most of us feel that we deserve more, that we are owed more enjoyment or more libidinal treasures that we've had to sacrifice some of them, that we've had to surrender some of those in order to get along with others in the social sphere. As such, we maintain a pre-existing condition of resentment towards enjoying others. As such, the perceived existence of enjoyment already implies a social relationship, one which exists before the other upon whom this stolen enjoyment will come to be projected. Here's the key point. The most rudimentary experience of jouissance implies the role of a culprit, someone who enjoys more than I and who's poised to steal the little enjoyment that I do possess. Or more directly put, my enjoyment typically exists in a negative form, in an already stolen form, and I blame you. I blame you for that. You have a surplus and I have a lack. The relationship of resentment comes first, prior to the other's arrival. Okay, so slightly belabored the point, but what we're trying to suggest here then is, and here's one of those moments, we've already had one, where we're trying to do a corrective to how racism is often understood. Todd McGowan helped us make the first one. Racism, more about enjoyment than simply about a cognitive error. Here's our second one. We often, even from a kind of liberal perspective, think about racism as a problem of otherness or a problem of cultural difference. Now, maybe that's the case, but what I've tried to argue here is that neurotic, everyday human subjects already have a predisposition to thinking someone else is enjoying more than me or has somehow got something that I'm deserved. If that's the case, then there's an enjoyment problem that comes before an otherness problem. So there's nothing, in, nothing intrinsically problematic about the racial other, the cultural other, the sexual other, although that's what we will tend to believe and want to, want to believe. The problem is more a question of the jouissance of the perceiver. And of course, we'll develop that. It's not just the jouissance of the perceiver, but the lack that the perceiving racist subject has. So I've got a nice quote from Sheldon here, but just let's recap, recapitulate that point quickly. The general psychoanalytic assumption here would be that I tend to experience my jouissance in a minor sign. It's gone, it's been taken away, I'm deserving of more. And when I see other people enjoying, I tend to have the tendency to think they're enjoying at my expense too much. If that argument sounds a little bit tricky, here's my best example of that. Man and wa uh, wife, husband and wife are having a fight. Uh, he says, oh, yes, actually, I did cheat on you. I was unfaithful. And you know what? I enjoyed it. And in that moment... I'm hoping you get my example. It's kind of like the damage is redoubled. Not only did he cheat, but he enjoyed it. In other words, to reiterate, other people seem to enjoy at my expense. I'm somehow hurt by the enjoyment of others. Okay, so here is my quote from Sheldon. This is Sheldon's book. And um, this is what Sheldon notes. He says, the other's jouissance or enjoyment is the very core around which otherness articulates itself. And that's what I'm trying to suggest. It's not just otherness per se that is engendering of prejudice racism. It's not just otherness per se, it's the attribution that the other is enjoying somewhat, that the other is, has some libidinal possession that is undeserved, that might be toxic, and that is experienced in a way that detracts from me. Now, of course, 
Many people who are hearing this probably are thinking, well, we've heard some of these ideas before. Some of these ideas already exist in the work of Fanon, okay? And that much is true. Fanon already knew it. But here is the distinctive Lacanian formulation. The Lacanian formulation is one that involves a new concept, the concept object BTR, or what we'll just call object A. This is the Lacanian notion. But let me try and put it in more straightforward terms. The quality that I see in you, that I perceive to be excessive, a surplus, a too much, a disturbing, toxic kind of enjoyment, that quality is not so much to do with you in this theory, rather that quality is a kind of externalization, a kind of displacement, a projection, if you will, of my own lack. So the thing that I perceive myself to be lacking, or the thing that I would like, quite like for myself, that I feel that I don't have, I perceive in an exaggerated, positivized, surplus quality in the other. That's basically the Lacanian notion. In other words, there's a kind of double distortion. The thing that I feel that I'm lacking is seen in the other in an exaggerated form, as an excessive property. We can see this kind of libidinal logic happening in virtually any basic stereotype. If we had more time, we could play with it and see if it works. Jean-Paul Sartre, who inspires Fanon, also has this idea, or a version of this idea. And he makes the quip, he says, well, isn't it kind of odd that in anti-Semitism, the key stereotypical element that is attributed to the Jewish person is that they like money, or they make money, or they have too much money. We could argue, hey, we're living in a capitalist world, what could be more desirable? And of course, in a whole series of different stereotypical attributions, you can see a similar libidinal logic. We can see it in, for example, the idea that uh, I am a heterosexual homophobic man, and I'm really hung up on the fact that gay men, they okay and everything, but they're having too much sex, always having sex. And of course, we can see it in the familiar, long-standing, historically obdurate colonial trope, which of course is the one that Fanon focuses on, is that the black male subject particularly is exceedingly problematic because of their sexually rapacious, this is Fanon's language, nature. They are too sexually active, which you could say is probably not a bad way of thinking the concealed lack or desire of the white racist subject who perceives that excess property in the other. Okay, let's move on. We've discussed a bunch of things. We've thought about what we could say is the basic state, bodily arousal, jouissance of the body. Okay, We've also started to think about the toxic threatening attributes that one projects, that one displaces onto various others. We've also made the point that it's not that others are, or cultural difference is itself a problem, it is made more problematic or it is made problematic by virtue of attributions of enjoyment. That's our little recap. Let's also note then an odd feature that qualifies many of these attributions of jouissance, of the problematic nature. We often find that these attributions of what is problematic about the other seem to coalesce around a sensual feature, a bodily feature, a cultural feature. They seem to have this thickness of culture, this bodiliness, this physicality about them. So let me give you a quote again. My library is slowly being depleted. DJ Derek is running out of records, but we've still got a bit of time. We're going to take a brief quote from Slavoj Žižek. And he gives us a nice, concise way of approaching a lot of what I've been saying. What is at stake in ethnic tensions is always a kind of possession. The other wants to steal our enjoyment. They want to ruin our way of life. And they've got access to some secret, perverse enjoyment. In short, what really gets on our nerves, what really bothers us about the other, is the particular way he organizes his enjoyment. The smell of his foods his noisy songs and dances, his strange manners, his attitudes to work. In the racist perspective, the other is always a workaholic stealing our jobs or an idler living on our labor. There's a jouissance problem here. There's a jouissance problem and the other is to blame for it. And interestingly, in that quote, for Zizek at least, sometimes it's a too much and sometimes it's a too little. 
Here's another corrective to how we often think about racism. Another corrective, you could say, to our familiar narratives about racism. It's not about bodily difference per se, or maybe bodily difference is a factor. But again, Sheldon's really made the point, and I'm going to find my quote from him. In the US today, says Sheldon George, hatred directed at rap music as a source of enjoyment or jouissance has come to be identified with African Americans more broadly. Contemporary discourse binds difference not simply to the body, but to jouissance. It's a really crucial point because sometimes we make this assumption that it's fundamentally about bodily difference, some kind of objective, seemingly difference, uh, whatever, you know, skin tone, all of this kind of stuff. But that is what underlies the frictions. But that's not enough, you could say, because one could then argue, well, why do some cultural differences seem to matter so much more than others? And it's a really insightful point, I think, on Sheldon's behalf, because we'll have some other examples of that. What is problematic is how the other enjoys. And often it can be music or cultural elements precisely of that sort. Okay, let's move on to our penultimate section. We're going to talk briefly about what I've called libidinal treasures. And I like this term because we've done this little map. We've, ex we've spoken a little bit about uh, racist enjoyment, the pleasures of hating. We've also spoken about possess possessiveness, libidinal uh, enjoyment as a possession and an attribute that the other is seen to have, a problematic, toxic element that the other is seen to have that, that, that threatens me. We should also note, however, that this Lacanian idea of the object A, this uh, je ne sais quoi quality that seems to underlie certain features of my hate or of my love, in this case hate, actually in this case love, also applies to me. So in narratives of racism, there's something problematic about the other and there's something precious about me. There's some libidinal treasure, which is crucial, I think, in narratives of racism. To, to mobilize a good racist discourse, you could say, you need to be able to highlight the treasure that defines me, my group, my community, my nation, that libidinal treasure that the other is taking away or is about to take away. Now, I figured what we should do here is read a little bit of Tony Blair. Yes, you heard that right. Tony Blair, the former British Prime Minister. Unfortunately, the book wasn't at the library, so I'm just going to have to read it. Sorry. But anyways, um, <clears throat> interestingly enough, in Tony Blair's biography, he has a section when he laments a certain thing that he did. He was very successful in outlawing fox hunting in the UK. He went about doing this, but he totally failed to grasp what would the reaction be of the fox hunting class. He totally failed to grasp the cultural significance, or as we could put it, the degree of enjoyment invested in this practice. This is what he says. The passions aroused by fox hunting were primeval. I completely misunderstood what is at stake. It was a tradition embedded by history and a profound community and set of social ties that was integral to a way of life. In other words, what Tony Blair did was he tried to take a certain mode of enjoyment away and presumably he paid the price. So what I just want to note here is that when we're thinking about flashpoints of racism, and I'll give some examples of that, what often seems to emerge, both in the narrativization of the logic of racism and also often in the kind of whatever spontaneous racist experience, is this sense that someone has taken something or threatening something that is precious to me. Now, I get a little tired sometimes of some of psychoanalytic terminology, but I think this is one of those moments where the notion of castration does actually work. And I looked it up. I looked it up. The dictionary says, well, one of the definitions is to be deprived of power, vitality or vigor. So what I think happens in these moments, this is a psychoanalytic reading, obviously, is that some of the flashpoint knee-jerk reactions is precisely or precisely articulated around the idea that someone is going to try and take some of my libidinal treasures. Now, of course, this also entails the possibility that you will have a whole variety of cynical politicians who don't even necessarily believe that's true, but they know that this is a potent political form of rhetoric to make people feel 
that something is being taken away from them. And that thing, let's also be clear, it's not just anything. It's my language, it's my history, it's my culture, it's my way of life, it's my right to bear arms, sorry, sorry. It, it could be any one of those different kinds of things, okay? That seems to be crucial for this. And let me also then add a, a little proviso. You can often see this, it's not hard to find in, in, in racist kinds of discourse. There's always that pivot. Often it involves vitality, it involves a mode of life, it involves one's children, it involves education, it involves those kinds of absolutely crucial signifiers that if taken away will mean, such as my argument, that I will cease to be. But here's the turn of the screw. It's easy in these kinds of fora to give examples of how that might work in a right-wing political world, but of course, let's also be honest, that would also apply presumably to everybody. So presumably I've also got my castration points, the things that I would have some kind of knee-jerk reaction to. I too have my libidinal treasures. And I think that's important to make mention of. Bringing it back to racism, just briefly, there's a great quote in um, a James Baldwin essay, the, the famous little, uh, The Fire Next Time. And it seems to me that in this essay, he, he does a nice Lacanian thing. Here's the quote. He says, uh, he seems to mobilize this idea of the libidinal treasure or the Lacanian object A. He says, white Americans find it as difficult as white people elsewhere do to di divest themselves of the notion that they are in possession of some intrinsic value that black people need or want. I think the quote stands on its own. Let me give an example of what I'm talking about in the libidinal treasures and, um, and why I think despite that some aspects of this theory may sound a little stylized, a little reductionistic, a little too psychological, but well, I think this is an important narrative logic and libidinal logic. And in order to do that, I'm going to give you another example. Sorry, it's also from a book of mine. But I mean, I don't have to apologize, right? I'm doing a talk, so it's okay. Right, so some colleagues and I were part of a group of researchers. We called ourselves the Apartheid Archive Project. And the overarching agenda of the project was to collect historical narratives of how people in South Africa in the period of apartheid, like a mixed demographic of people, recollected, remembered moments of racism. So, as I was going through all of these examples, we collected a whole bunch of these narratives. And I thought, well, look, dude, you're doing all this, like, whatever, enjoyment, racism thing. Do you think it really works? Let's have a look in, in some of these examples. And so I also did this thing, which you're supposed to do if you're like a clinician and you're psychoanalytic, you're supposed to say, okay, now something has happened. Why now? Why not earlier? Why did it happen now? What is the specificity of the situation? What immediately preceded it? And this is what I started to find. What was the thing that happens before this racist outburst that is being described in the narratives? I was struck by just how frequently such eruptions of racist anger were the result of a perceived infringement of sorts. Such racist behavior typically followed the breaking of a law of enjoyment. The list of such infringements was as long as it was varied. Black children swimming in a white-only swimming pool. Black families polluting and overcrowding traditionally white tourist spots. Black children driving down the standards of education at formerly white schools. The idea and this is a direct quote from one of the narratives, that black should not watch blue movies, pornography, black should not watch blue movies because it gives them ideas of how to rape a white woman. I think I can rest my case. I'm not saying that this analytical motif, this concept explains everything, but it's certainly a tenacious and reoccurring feature within those narratives. We could say that this persistence and tenacity seems to tell us something about racism, that so many times we see this theme of a kind of stolen treasure, a threatening extraction of sorts. So let's see if we can, um, <clears throat> let's see if we can draw some more conclusions from this. One of the ideas that we should make on this basis is that we have all got some kind of libidinal treasures. And in that respect, okay, it's helpful. So we don't just say, well, it's only other people who've got this problem. Okay, I suppose that that's kind of obvious. 
That being said, I think it's also important to note that if we're thinking psychoanalytically, what I perceive as my libidinal treasure, that thing that's so special about me, presumably there's always a degree of narcissism, always a degree of inflation, always a degree of some kind of fantasy elaboration about what that attribute might be. Also, oddly enough, we are after all doing a counterintuitive thing tonight. Oddly enough, is it not also the case that sometimes we feel a righteous indignation at being robbed? That we revel, that we, uh, that we enjoy precisely the indignation that this precious thing about me is being taken away. And I suppose what I'm wondering is that, is it sometimes the case that the thing that I take to be defining of me is most powerfully realized and experienced precisely when I feel that it's being taken away. Or put differently, might it be that I'm stumbling over myself for the opportunity to complain that someone has stolen this special thing about me, that the more I feel that it's potentially stolen, extracted, the more it somehow exists for me. That may sound a little bit precarious, but I had a moment not so long ago when I was watching Fox uh, uh, News or Fox TV, and um, I just, it's kind of a silly anecdote, but I think it kind of illustrates the point. There was, a, there was an anchor who was saying, um, Alexandra, the, the Democratic Congresswoman, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, had apparently uh, suggested that we need to do more about nutrition. And this guy was saying, she's taking our hamburgers away. She's taking your hamburgers away. And I was kind of like, okay, I'm not so sure she's really taking your hamburgers away. But in that moment, it felt to me that there are sometimes precisely these odd libidinal moments where one kind of contrives a situation where one hopes one can complain that someone is taking something away from oneself precisely so one can have the libidinal rewards of complaining about it and experiencing it as somehow real, perhaps more real than it was before. Let's give a nice quote to try and illustrate that point. And the Lacanian idea here would be that precisely in those moments when there are certain libidinal treasures which are narcissistically appealing, which are so symbolically important for my identity and which give me some kind of pleasure, those ideas are presumably a little bit phantasmatic. Yanis Stavrakakis, we're on our second last book, so we're almost there has a great book called Lacan and the Political, and he makes this point. He's talking about jouissance enjoyment within the political domain as bonding groups. He says, no matter how much we love our national ways of enjoyment, our national myths of greatness, they are always already premised on a type of lack. Such apparent satisfactions are never enough. There's always something that's missing. There's always a surplus that is missing. Within the national fantasy, this lost can be attributed to the existence of an alien culture or alien people, others. The enjoyment lacking from our national community is being denied to us because they stole it. They are to blame for this theft of enjoyment. What is not realized within such a schema is the fact that we never had it at our disposal in the first place, this supposedly full enjoyment. We never had that enjoyment, or at least in the way we imagine or think or fantasize we had it, we never had the full enjoyment that we accused the other of having stolen. That's his conclusion. We can make two interesting assertions here. Number one, and many other psychoanalytic theories of racism have already made this point, that makes the racist subject highly dependent, highly dependent precisely on the person they're complaining about, right? Because the attribution that they've stolen something away from me in a way gives it a reality that it may not have had otherwise. The second conclusion that we get from that is not only that there is a dependency of the racist subject on the person they're complaining about, on the group that they complain about. There's also here a sense that, okay, we've made this idea that I kind of sometimes willingly gravitate towards a position of being the victim, but that my projections of greatness, of fantastic whatever, were never really there. And this leads us to a further conclusion. Not only are we then dependent on, on the person that we blame, but again, maybe our attributions of a lost enjoyment make it possible for us to believe that there was one that we had when maybe we never did. Let's make one further set of points and then I will conclude. 
Um, this is the last section. I call it the rules of enjoyment. And our second last quote for tonight comes from Friedrich Nietzsche. Friedrich Nietzsche has this to tell us. He's talking about the genealogy of morals, and he makes this reference to Thomas Aquinas. Maybe you know it. Thomas Aquinas has the view that God-fearing believers will one day have the pleasure of watching the damned suffering in hell. In Aquinas' own words, as cited by Nietzsche, the blessed in the heavenly kingdom will see the torment of the damned so that they may even more thoroughly enjoy, enjoy, enjoy their blessedness. Why are we introducing that idea now? In the last few moments of the talk, what I want to suggest then is that it's important to think about how enjoyment is suffused with, intertwined with law. In that example, we see that law in some ways, or morality in some ways, is, you could say, dependent on a certain mode of jouissance. I will enjoy sinful people's suffering. This is part of how I, I am godly. This is how I am moral. We have a dilemma then that in many instances, jouissance supports and extends the law. And of course, this is not a difficult concept to grasp because we could say that the passion for justice very quickly turns into something a little less than honorable. We could say that jouissance supports and extends social norms. We have in any social situation, in any society, a set of unspoken rules of enjoyment defining who can enjoy, who should enjoy, and who shouldn't, and under what circumstances. Brief example, I would read it out, but we're running a bit short on times. Uh, the New York Times in 2004, 2011 has an article. The article is given the byline, partying amid poverty stirs debate in South Africa. Here it goes, uh, extract. Samson, South Africa. Kenny Kuneni, a former gangster turned businessman, gave what he called the mother of all parties for his 30th, 40th birthday. He ate sushi from the belly of a woman who was wearing nothing but black lingerie. While hundreds of guests looked on, as the revelers got tipsy on his liquor, he says he treated the most important amongst them, including President Zuma's stylish spokesman, to $1,000 bottles of Don Perignon. The opposition leader, uh, Zwelimzimi Vavi, accused Mr. Kuneni of spitting on the faces of the poor and declared that parties where people have gotten rich in such dubious ways and flaunt their wealth turn my stomach. Perhaps my example, the implication is clear. I'm not a big supporter necessarily of Kenny myself. I think there's a lot of lifestyle choices that he could have made differently. I don't think he think there's some things he could improve upon. But isn't it interesting that if that same set of activities had been conducted by a series of white uh, high-flying, whatever, South African politicians or businessmen, it wouldn't have been quite so newsworthy. In other words, modes of enjoyment, as they are socially realized, bring with them a tacit set of rules of who should enjoy, in what capacity, and why. What we can then say, and this is one of our further contributions to, to thinking about how this notion of enjoyment and racism as enjoyment may stretch and challenge us how we think about racism is that racism as enjoyment is not merely a psychological factor. Some of what I've said may sound like that, but these kinds of examples suggest that enjoyment undergirds law and public morals, and it takes on a super egoic quality. Got one last example. We could imagine thinking about being the proverbial alien from another planet who comes to do a bit of uh, sociological research on planet Earth. Your question, alien researcher, would be to go into a certain social situation and say, excuse me, what are the rules of enjoyment here? Who's allowed to enjoy in certain ways and who's not allowed to enjoy in those ways? What are the double standards of your rules of enjoyment here? And in what way do they contrast the publicly acceptable social norms of that situation? That'd be a good research project. Let me end then. I could go on, as is probably apparent, but let me end, um, I know uh, Sheldon might take up some of these points, with a brief example, uh, and my library is now finished. Uh, the journalist's name is Johan Hari. He's got a book called Chasing the Screen, and it's a book about the war on drugs. Here is what Johan Hari wants to tell us. In his Chasing the Screen, Johan Hari offers a compelling argument that the war on drugs was motivated not so much by the need to uphold law and order, or by any concern with the life and welfare of addicts, but by a far less morally defensible agenda. 
Here's a quote. The argument we hear today for the drug war are that we must protect teenagers from drugs and prevent addiction. We assume, looking back, that these were the reasons that this war was launched, but they were not. The main reason given for banning drugs, the reason obsessing the men who launched the war, was that various minorities, blacks, Mexicans, Chinese, were using these chemicals for getting their place and menacing white people. My comment says, the agenda here seems to have been driven not only by fury at the fact that people were indulging in problematic forms of enjoyment, alien and potentially contaminating forms of enjoyment, but that minority groups were forgetting their place. Harry Anslinger, says Joanne Hurry, was the first commissioner of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, and he detested jazz, quoting Joanne Hurry. Jazz for Ainslinger was a mongrel music made up of European, Caribbean, and African echoes, all mating on American shores. To Anslinger, this was musical anarchy, an evidence of a recurrence of the primitive impulses that lurk in black people waiting to emerge. The lives of jazz men, he said, reek of filth. My comment, jazz music to Anslinger was inseparable from the evils of alcohol and drug abuse, and his vendetta against narcotics soon became focused on the jazz world. This is the kind of uh, summary of Hari's book, and particularly on one particular, uh, subsequently, one particular target, Billie Holiday. My observation is, it seems difficult here to avoid concluding that Anslinger was particularly troubled by such other modes of enjoyment, and that the war on drugs was partly motivated precisely by such a hatred of enjoyment. The point then, and I really will conclude now, is that jouissance entwines itself with law. We get jouissance by exerting law, by implementing law. But it's also the case that sometimes laws get written as a result of formations of jouissance. In conclusion then, racism is not, as much psychological theory might have it, an array or simply an array of attitudes and prejudices. It's a set of something more than that. Racism pivots also on a series of symbolic values, on libidinal treasures, which crucially involve a potent moral dimension. This is crucial. This is why I've been trying to highlight the connection between jouissance and law. That jouissance supports law, that law invokes jouissance, and also, in certain instances, that law follows on from modes of jouissance. This idea that racism might involve a potent moral dimension is often overlooked in popular impressions of racism as simple ignorance, as racism as unfounded hate or intolerance. While racism may indeed be all of these things, it also involves a type of indignation, an impetus to blame and to punish. It involves a sense of laws and societal, if racist, norms and ideals that have been violated. Racism is also, at least in part, a moral formation and it involves the force and the enjoyment of the superego.